If you'd like to open up your Bibles to the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, that's where we spend our time on on Sunday morning, focusing in on, honing in on verses 22, 23, and 24, which read, The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in Him. And so again, Sunday morning we talked about this. We talked about suffering and and about the fact that I believe there's a greater reason for a believer's suffering than simply sanctification. Though that is a reason. Having our lives purified and strengthened is important. But even more important than that is seeing the character and the nature of God as Jeremiah so beautifully describes here, right at the apex, at the centerpiece of the book of Lamentations. I love how it reads and how unique it is that you you begin Lamentations and you climb to the summit, which is at the center, and then you kind of come back down, which we will do tonight. That was Sunday. Monday morning... You all know by now, massive F5 tornado set down in Newcastle, Oklahoma, cutting that devastating two-mile-wide path through Moore, Oklahoma. Was that the finger of God? You said on Sunday, Pastor Rick, that God is behind the curtain of suffering at times. Not to assume that it's Satan and not to assume that it's our sin, not to assume natural disaster, but that God is sometimes at that place. Was that the finger of God on Monday? And I'm not going to try to answer that tonight. I want to think about it and pray about it a little bit more. I can tell you this much, that the cure to suffering is verses 21, 22, 23, 24. The cure to suffering is the Lord's loving kindnesses, which never cease. The cure to our suffering is His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. The remedy is His faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. And of course, the balm of healing is our portion, which is the Lord. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in Him. What's interesting is the next 16 verses of chapter 3 read like an instruction manual for applying the balm of His healing to our wounds. And I had already decided I wanted to come back and look at that as kind of a suffering part 2, considering and thinking about suffering part 2 on this coming Sunday. And then, of course, the tornado hit on Monday. Then I thought, how timely. So we're going to wait to cover those 16 verses until Sunday morning. So let's go on, beginning in verse 41, as Jeremiah continues in the third lament, the third elegy. We lift up our hearts and hands toward God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. You have not pardoned. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain and have not spared. And you have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You have made us mere offscouring and refuse in the midst of the peoples. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Judah was seen as refuse, offscouring. Offscouring, another way to say that is the scum of the earth. Judah is the scum. Because of their rebellion, now they're cast out. Now they're seen as the offscouring in the nations of the world. And all they can do is weep and moan over their situation. But I wonder, what of those who have suffered and are hated by the world because of Christ Jesus? What about them? What about us? What's interesting is in contrast to this, Verse 46 saying, all of our enemies have opened their mouths against us. In contrast, Paul talks about the response of Jesus' people. See, the people of Judah now are in the place of lamentation and the place of weeping. As we might be tempted to do, especially when people come down on us or when people revile your Christianity. Or when people slander you simply because you're a believer. They say you're an idiot. They say you can't possibly be an intellectual if you believe that stuff. They call you the scum of the earth. 
And there are those on the planet right now who would be just thrilled if we could do away with Christianity and then all the problems and the world's ills would be solved. If religion was done away with, we'd be okay. So how do you react? How do you respond to that? We can, like Judah, we can lament. We can gather in the barn midweek and Sunday morning and say, Woe is us, hang in there, team. We'll take one for Jesus. Ow. Or we can have a different response. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 12, When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. And so Paul makes that comparison. Judah called the scum of the earth here in Lamentations 3. Paul says, hey, we're called that. So how do we respond to it? We bless, we endure, we try to conciliate. And think about how radically different that is than the world. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. When the, when the world is slandered, they cut you off. And maybe you've done that. That's our human inclination. Someone slanders me, I'm done. I'm not going to be in a relationship with you anymore. You slandered me. You've gone after me. We're through. I'm just not going to talk to you. See, that's actually the nice response of a person in the world. Okay, I just won't have anything to do with you. The mean response would be to go back after that person. But our world says, no, no, if you can at least just cut the person off, you're cool. Paul says, no. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We try to make it right. We do what we can. Sometimes you do everything you can for conciliation with a person and they won't have it. But you still try to conciliate. That word conciliate, I'm kind of sitting on it here for a minute because it's an interesting word in the Greek. It's parakaleo. Does that sound familiar, Bible students? Paraklesis, the Holy Spirit. It is the word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. When we are slandered, we come alongside. When we are slandered, we comfort. When we are slandered, we help. When we are slandered, we do what the Holy Spirit does. And we can do what the Holy Spirit does because we share His Spirit. Now see, that's the difference. Without His Spirit, you're slandered. The best you can do is moan and cut someone off. But you have the Holy Spirit of the living God dwelling within you and therefore the ability to conciliate even if your fleshly nature doesn't want to. We're slandered, we conciliate. We parakaleo. We know that suffering for Jesus' sake is always a blessing because we have His Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 5.11, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of Me. We are blessed as we share in His Spirit, but we're also blessed for another reason. We are blessed as we share in His suffering. Now, I want to make some comparison here as we walk through these, these chapters to Judah and the church, or between Judah and the church. How they responded, what they went through, how we respond when suffering. I don't know why, by the way. I don't know why this message at this time for this fellowship. I've never really known why. Over the years as we've been in certain places in Scripture and, and certain messages are taught, and, and from time to time I'll say, Lord, why... Are we being taught this? Because honestly, right now, Bridge Fellowship, is anyone here really being heavily slandered? Anybody being reviled for your faith? Maybe one or two, perhaps, if we pulled the whole fellowship. But I'm not. Things actually seem pretty good. You know, we're moving forward on our building program. We're working on stuff. We're spreading out as a fellowship. We're engaged in, in kingdom work. I'm excited. Good stuff's happening. And so I read this and I think, what are you trying to say, Lord? Part of me wonders if this is not preparation for future days. If the Lord isn't saying, look, I am preparing you for days to come because there are going to be some hard days ahead. There are going to be some things that you as a fellowship, that you as individual believers will face simply because you believe in me. And so I want you to be prepared. And so we're dealing with this ahead of time. Understand these two principles. We are blessed when people insult us and persecute us and falsely say all kinds of evil against us because of Christ. 
because we share in His Spirit and we share in His sufferings. How exactly are we blessed by sharing in His sufferings? Hold that thought and read on. Verse 47. Jeremiah writes, Panic and pitfall have befallen us. Devastation and destruction. My eyes run down with streams of water because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes pour down unceasingly without stopping until the Lord looks down and sees from heaven. And you know what I hear in that? I hear hope. I am weeping now. I am in anguish now. I am suffering now, Jeremiah says, until the Lord looks down from heaven because the Lord will look down from heaven. And what's happening here with this injection of hope is that Jeremiah's revelation of God's character, catch this, does not immediately soothe his suffering. You would almost expect after the verses in Chapter 3, of verse 22, 23, 24, the loving kindness, the compassion, the faithfulness, the portion, the hope, that after reading that, suddenly the suffering would begin to alleviate. That perhaps you would get better. And we talked about Sunday. Man, when you're hurting, when you're suffering, you look at the character of the Lord. You look at His nature. You keep your eyes on Jesus. But understand this. It doesn't mean your suffering will instantly cease. Didn't with Jeremiah. He goes right where he needs to go, to the character of God. But his suffering continues. His eyes still pour down tears. He is still in this place of pain. But what does happen when we look to the Lord is though our suffering may not decrease immediately, our false hope gets replaced by true hope. The false hope is that it's just going to get better on its own. The false hope is what the false prophets gave the people of Judah. They said, it's all going to be good. There's going to be peace. The people already in captivity, they're going to come home quickly. False hope. It didn't happen. And when it didn't happen, the despair got worse. But look to Jesus in your suffering, and though you may still be in that place of pain, now you replace false hope with real hope, true hope. As I see Him... I consider His grace. I consider His mercy. I consider His faithfulness. And now I can say, I've got one to believe in. I know God's going to look down from heaven until the Lord looks down and sees from heaven, verse 50. And now I have an injection of hope. Though I hurt, still I hope. And now the purifying work of sanctification can begin. Now I'm in the place where stuff can start to happen in my heart, in my life. 2 Corinthians 1.5 says, Just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 10, He prays that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. We've talked about that. Paul wanted to fellowship in the suffering of Christ. Paul says, I want to share his suffering. Why, Paul? Because the more I, listen, the more I share in his suffering, the more I become like him. That as I share in the sufferings of Christ, I am conformed to the image of Christ. When I return blessing for being reviled, When I endure when I'm persecuted, when I offer conciliation when someone slanders me, I become more like Jesus. Sanctification. My daughter Anna Marie asked me, Dad, what does sanctification mean? Honey, it's being made more like Jesus. It's the purifying work of His Spirit. But we don't get to that place of sanctification until we look to the Lord. Until we draw back the curtain of our suffering and see Him for who He is, gracious, compassionate, faithful. And as we see Him, He begins to work in our suffering. He begins to work through our pain, conforming us to the image of Christ Jesus. That's what's taking place in Jeremiah's life right now as we study this, as we read. That's what's going on in Judah. That is the Judah who are now in exile. Do you realize that? Painful though it was, suffering though it caused, difficult 
though that exile would be and recognizing the destruction of their homeland, the people in exile now are ready to be sanctified. Now they're ready for a 70-year process of having the idolatry washed out of their lives. It's hard, it's painful, but it works. And God understands this. The suffering remains, but the purifying work of sanctification is underway. Still painful. Verse 51, my eyes bring pain to my soul because of all the daughters of my city. He says, my enemies without cause hunted me down like a bird. They have silenced me in the pit and have placed a stone on me. Waters flowed over my head. I said, I'm cut off. I called on your name, O Lord, out of the lowest pit. You have heard my voice. Do not hide your ear from my prayer for relief, from my cry for help. You drew near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. O Lord, you have pleaded my soul's cause. You have redeemed my life. Now, Jeremiah does something interesting here. All of a sudden, the language changes from the second person to the first person. Jeremiah now is talking about himself. He is personally identifying his own previous suffering with the current misery of Judah. Do you see what he's talking about? Look at verse 53 again. They have silenced me in the pit and have placed a stone on me. You know what he's talking about? Jeremiah chapter 38. We read the story. Jeremiah was thrown into a pit. Jeremiah was dumped into a cistern. Jeremiah 38 verse 6 tells us they took Jeremiah, they cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern there was no water but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. Now, in verse 54, Lamentations 3, he says, Waters flowed over my head. But in Jeremiah 38, verse 6, it says, There was no water in the cistern, only mud. So are we talking about two different things or the same thing? And I thought about this. I thought, well, perhaps the waters he was describing were thick mud because he sank. He literally sank down into them. He was dying in there. In fact, chapter 38 of Jeremiah tells us, had they left him there, he would have died. So I don't know if he was treading mud <laughs> to stay afloat, but it was a bad situation. And as he recalls the situation, now in Lamentations 3, he says, Waters flowed over my head. Muddy water, perhaps, or perhaps something else. That the waters, the word water there, machim in the Hebrew, is a poetic type of misery. Water describing his misery as they dropped him down into that cistern. The psalmist Understands that. Psalm 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. Deliver me from the mire, and do not let me sink. May I be delivered from my foes and from the deep waters. May the flood of water not overflow me, nor the deep water swallow me up, nor the pit shut its mouth on me. This is verses 14 and 15 of Psalm 69. Jeremiah, I believe, is painting a picture here of his own previous suffering and his previous rescue in comparison to Judah's current suffering. He's drawing the two together because he comes down to the end of it and he says, You drew near when I called you. You said, Do not fear. O Lord, you've pleaded my soul's cause. You've redeemed my life. You pulled me out of the pit. Remember who did that? A guy named... Ebed Melech, whose name means servant of the king. The Ethiopian, Ebed Melech, got some guys together, went to the king and said, He's dying in there. And the king said, Get him out. Uh, they got him out. Zedekiah, who was, you know, a weak king, said, Yeah, get him out of there. So they go down, they drop some things down, they pull him out. They redeemed his life literally from the pit. Jeremiah understood that in the worst situation of his life up until then, dying in that cistern, that God saw to his rescue. And so now he applies this to the lamentation of his own people. You will draw near. You will rescue. He knew the Lord. And he knew God's word. And that's how Jeremiah could know with all certainty God's people would be rescued. 
Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 1, the word told us it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. And you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Jeremiah knew this. He knew the Word. And Jeremiah knew the Lord. And by the way, Jesus was also thrown down into a pit. In fact, these, these words are almost prophetic for Christ Jesus. He felt the waters of death and despair encompass him. He was not only thrown into a pit, perhaps a holding pit in the house of Caiaphas, we believe, but he went into the pit of death, the lowest pit, as Jeremiah writes here. Where is that? In verse... 55, I called on your name, O Lord, out of the lowest pit. He says in verse 53, you placed a stone on me as the stone was rolled in front of the tomb of Christ. And yet even Jesus in his death knew the Father was going to come to get him. By the way, who raised Jesus from the dead? Do you know? Any guesses? I can't hear you because of the rain. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God did. Jesus, who else? The Holy Spirit, you're all right. You can find all three mentioned related to the saving of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus resurrecting himself, God the Father resurrecting Jesus, and the Holy Spirit involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a full-on Trinity thing. Everybody involved. So what does this all tell us? Jeremiah identifies his own life in the pit. The people of Judah now suffering their own lives as if they were in the pit. Jesus himself in the pit. What does this tell us? You cannot suffer for the sake of righteousness without sharing in the sufferings of Christ. That's the value of sharing in Christ's sufferings. When you suffer for righteousness sake, when you suffer as a believer in Jesus, when you are reviled for that reason, you share in the sufferings of Jesus. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 4.13, To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Sanctification is sharing in His suffering. That is sanctification. Being purified just as Jesus was pure. We'll continue on, verse 59. O Lord, you have seen my oppression. Judge my case. You have seen all their vengeance, all their schemes against me. You have heard their reproach, O Lord. All their schemes against me. The lips of my assailants and their whispering are against me all day long. Look on their sitting and their rising. I am their mocking song. You will recompense them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You will give them hardness of heart. Your curse will be on them. And note this, you will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. Jeremiah's own personal life example meshes with Israel's hope as he prays for the Lord's judgment. And note this, the judgment that he prays for is that God will judge all those who stand opposed to Israel. And I think that applies today. As much as it applied then, there is a judgment coming for all of those who stand opposed to Israel. I pulled up in front of the Adrift Cafe uh, last Thursday, I believe it was. Met my brother for breakfast there. I pulled up behind this gray minivan... And it had some Whidbey Island environmental bumper stickers on it. And it had another bumper sticker on it that was black and green and red and yellow. And it said, Free Palestine. It was all I could do to walk into the restaurant and not to go knock on the windshield and go, Dude, have you ever been to Israel? Do you know what you're proclaiming? 
Do you know where you stand? Because Jeremiah said, Pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. All those who would set themselves against God's people. And a judgment is coming for that. And it's not my judgment. In fact, it's not even my desire. I'm not anti-Palestinian. I'm not anti-Arab. I'm not anti-any person. But those who set themselves against the people of God, they're going to be judged. Even as Jeremiah prayed for it. But this sets the stage now for the next lament. The fourth lamentation, the fourth elegy. How dark the gold has become. How the pure gold has changed. The sacred stones are poured out at the corner of every street. The precious sons of Zion weighed against fine gold. How they are regarded as earthen jars, the work of a potter's hand. I read this and at first I thought, maybe Jeremiah is comparing the people to gold and precious stones. And saying now they've become like pottery. I I don't think so. I think this is a literal statement here. When he says how dark the gold has become, the pure gold has changed. Talking about that gilded gold in the temple. As the temple burned to the ground, the gold would be blackened by the smoke and the fire. And the stones, the sacred stones are poured out at the corner of every street. My imagination saw like diamonds and rubies and sapphires thrown out on the ground. That's not what he's talking about. What do you think the sacred stones are? Anyone? The actual stones of the temple. Sacred because they were the temple. Now poured out at the edge of every street. You can go today to Jerusalem. Stand at the southern edge of the temple mount. Or below it. And see the sacred stones. Stones that were thrown one after another. Not from this fall of Jerusalem, but from the next one in A.D. 70. As Jesus said, Matthew 24, 2. Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Jeremiah describes as he's writing, he looks. The gilded gold is nothing but smoke, blackened. And the precious stones that once were the beautiful walls of the temple... Now smashed, thrown off the Temple Mount at the corner of every street coming around where the temple once stood. This lament speaks again of the fall of the actual temple and then verse 2 of the precious sons of Zion weighed against the fine gold or weighed against the beauty of God's things. They're regarded as earthen jars, the work of a potter's hand. Now, you need to understand... Remember, the fourth lament parallels the second lament. One and five, two and four, three at the top. Okay. So the fourth lament is a lament that is about the Lord. Looks at the Lord, focuses on the Lord. The second lament was the devastation of the Lord's anger. Here in the fourth lament, it's the defense of the Lord's judgment. And I want you to watch this going through. But Jeremiah in this lament justifies the judgment of God. He defends why God did what He did. Watch what He says, verse 3. Even the jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel, like ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the infant cleaves to the roof of its mouth because of thirst. The little ones ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Judah is pictured here as an ostrich. And an ostrich is a poor parent. In the wilderness, the ostrich is a bad mama. Does not do well by its children. Job tells us this, Job 39 verse 14. The Lord says, she abandons her eggs to the earth and warms them in the dust. And she forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly as if they were not hers. Though her labor be in vain, she's unconcerned. And Jeremiah is looking at his people and he sees how his people reacted during the siege of Jerusalem. And he says, they're like ostriches the way they treat their young. Obviously in the siege of Jerusalem, the parents didn't know what to do. They became crazed with hunger themselves. But the sad truth is when a parent sins, the child often is the one who pays the price. 
And I'm not, I'm not talking about blame. I'm talking about consequence. That the child doesn't get the blame for the parent's sin, but the child wears so often. And you know this. We know this. Adults know. Many of you feel or have felt the consequence of the sins of your parents or their parents. And sometimes our own children, they feel the weight of the consequence of our sin choices. What parent wants their child to pay for their sin? And yet, tragically, it happens all the time. Jesus warned the women of Jerusalem as He went out to the cross, saying in Luke 23, 28, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for Me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And 40 days after Jesus said that, or 40 years actually, Jerusalem replayed the terror Jeremiah describes again for a whole second time. And I believe there are days coming when this may be said again, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. There is a day coming on this world when that will be said again. Verse 5, he goes on, those who ate delicacies are desolate in the streets. Those reared in purple embrace the ash pits. For the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown as in a moment, and no hands were turned toward her. Now, think about that. How is it possible that the sin of Judah was greater than the sin of Sodom? I mean, wouldn't you imagine if I asked you what was the, the worst sin in all of history? What town was the worst sinning town and was judged for it, wouldn't you automatically go to Sodom and Gomorrah? I don't think I would go straight to Jerusalem. How is Jerusalem's sin, Judah's sin, worse than the sin of Sodom? And you need to understand this in terms of the punishment. You see, the punishment of the sin of Sodom was instantaneous. Instantaneously burned to the ground. The punishment of Jerusalem was a two-year siege. A two-year-long period of intense suffering and sorrow. You look at the two, and the punishment of Jerusalem was far worse than the punishment of Sodom, which was quick and over. But Jerusalem, it went on and on. Verse 7, Her consecrated ones were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than corals. Their polishing was like lapis lazuli. That's a sapphire type stone. Their appearance now, you can say, is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the street. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It is withered. It has become like wood. Verse 8 is a comparison to verse 7. Verse 7 saying how pure and, and, and beautiful. Where, they, where it says that they're... They were more ruddy in body than corals. It's talking about about how, how alive they were. You know, their cheeks blushing red, red like coral. They were vital. And now, now verse 8 says they are shriveled and withered. He says in verse 9, Better are those slain with the sword than those slain with hunger, for they pine away being stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of the compassionate women boiled their own children. We read this before. They became food for them because of the destruction of the daughters, daughter of my people. That was prophesied in Deuteronomy 28. Verse 11, the Lord has accomplished His wrath. He has poured out His fierce anger and He has kindled a fire in Zion which has consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe nor did any of the inhabitants of the world that the adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. They just, they were shocked. They figured of all the places in the land of Judah, Jerusalem was safe. No one's going to pass these gates. We have the temple here. We're okay. We'll be all right. They couldn't believe it. The world couldn't believe it when Nebuchadnezzar stormed in, when his troops took the holy city. But note this, verse 13, because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquity of her priests who have shed in her midst the blood of the righteous. 
They wandered, blind in the streets. They were defiled with blood so that no one could touch their garments. Depart, unclean, they cried of themselves. Depart, depart, do not touch. So they fled and wandered. Men among the nations said they shall not continue to dwell with us. Back in verse 13, he gives defense. More defense for the judgment of God because of the sin and the iniquity of her leadership. The priests, the prophets, those who went before the people, those who were supposed to lead the people, were so sinful in and of themselves. And of course, the people following their leaders were just as sinful. And therefore, justification for judgment, Jeremiah would say. As men among the nations said, they shall not continue to dwell with us. Is that not what has been done to the Jewish people across the centuries? Kicked out of one country after another after another. Pogroms and and persecutions against the people of God. Verse 16, the presence of the Lord has scattered them. He will not continue to regard them. They did not honor the priests. They did not favor the elders. Yet our eyes failed, for help was useless. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save. Verse 17, he's probably talking about Egypt. We watch for another nation. Egypt, can you help us? Edom, perhaps. Or, or, or the Ammonites, could they help us? And they were trying to go to the other nations to get some help to fight Babylon. It didn't do them any good. Verse 18, they hunted our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were finished, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of the sky. They chased us on the mountains. They waited in ambush for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we had said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Then Jeremiah turns and says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, who dwells in the land of Uths. But the cup will come around to you as well. You will become drunk and make yourself naked. Verse 22, The punishment of your iniquity has been completed, O daughter of Zion. He will exile you no longer, but he will punish your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will expose your sins. And that's interesting to me. He's talking directly of a judgment of Edom after talking of a judgment of Jacob. Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Edom, the brothers. Edom comes from Esau, as you know. And the judgment is severe because the brother fought against the brother. The brother was opposed to the brother. That's what's remarkable to me for all the fighting in the Middle East. You realize the Arabs and the Israelis are brothers. They are related. They all draw back. They are all Shemitic people. They all come of the line of Shem. Distant cousins. And yet, there is this everlasting enmity, the Bible calls it, between them. Jeremiah justifies in this lament the Lord's righteous wrath against both Judah and Edom. But he changes direction here at the end, going after Edom. And we'll see this actually more fully when we get to the prophecies of Obadiah. One chapter prophecy only against the people of Edom. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, The house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be stubble. And they will set on them fire and consume them, so there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Now, I move through the fourth lament kind of quickly on purpose. Because the bottom line is, throughout this lament, there is a larger issue. God's judgment is always justified, and especially His judgment against mankind, it's justified for one specific reason. And that is the sin nature of man. We don't have a leg to stand on, gang. We don't have a right to stand before God and say, How could you judge us this way? Our sin nature and our sin choices. This is not just a Jewish problem. This is a human problem. It's the human condition. And because of the very human condition and the rebellious nature that we all share, God has every right to judge. Psalm 49 verse 10 says, 
he sees wise men die. The stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is their houses are forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. They've called their lands after their own names. (laughs) But man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. Now quickly, I want you to understand something. and Let me dial it down this way. Every dispensation of man has deserved judgment. Dispensation, what do you mean? The history of man can be divided up. Don't let the word dispensation freak you out. It's just kind of a theological term. It simply means an age of man, and it means during that age, the relationship that God has with man makes up a dispensation. And there are roughly seven in the history of the world. If you're a note taker, you might want to jot these down. Seven different ages or dispensations and consider how God dealt with man and how man responded to God. Dispensation number one. The dispensation of innocence. It's that age of Adam and Eve. Created in the garden, given the garden to tend, Created as eternal beings, they could eat of the tree of the fruit of life life, all they wanted for as long as they wanted. Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? So Adam and Eve in this first dispensation are in a relationship with God. And they sinned. First dispensation, first sin. They rebelled against God. They ate of the tree they were told not to. And so the judgment of that dispensation is paradise lost. Driven out of the Garden of Eden. Paradise lost, the fall of the curses given in Genesis chapter 3. That's our first dispensation. That's how the world got started. Second dispensation. Called the dispensation of conscience. So we have innocence first, now we have conscience. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. These are after they're driven out of the Garden. They have a third son. Remember his name? Seth. Seth. And to Seth, Genesis 4.26 tells us, also was born a son. He called him Enosh. And then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Or, it can also be translated at that time, men began to be called by the name of the Lord. After Adam and Eve now are driven out of the garden, the relationship changes. In the garden, it was a relationship that was immediate. Out of the garden, it is now the dispensation of conscience. Man, knowing right and wrong. Having eaten of the fruit of that tree, now knowing good and evil, so conscience enters into the picture. And Genesis chapter 5 covers the ten generations going from Adam all the way to Noah. But it wasn't long, you know, before corruption and violence covered the entire planet. Genesis 6.11, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence. I'm glad we're not filled with violence these days. When violence is what we play. I mean, the best-selling video games out there are horribly violent. Well, but it's just a game. It's vicarious violence that is being acted out. And this generation is acting out violence more than any generation before it. And it deeply concerns me. Genesis 6.12 says, God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth except for eight people. Noah, his sons and their wives, and Mrs. Noah. They were the eight. I've said this before. It got so bad in that dispensation, there were eight people left on planet Earth. Do you understand that? That if prior to the flood, the entire Earth became corrupt, even Noah and his family, there never would have been the opportunity for Christ to come into the world and to bring redemption. Specifically for those who lived before. All of those who lived in faith before the flood, before the earth got so bad, men like Seth, men who called upon the name of the Lord, they would be lost because there would be no redeeming sacrifice for them. And so God sees eight people left and says, get in the boat. Judgment of the second dispensation was the flood. Mankind completely wiped out. Eight people saved immediately, and all those who died in faith before the flood were saved eternally by God's action in that judgment. Third dispensation. You could call the dispensation of civil governance. 
Because after the flood, God gave Noah a new covenant. The third dispensation now covers the period from Noah all the way to Abram. The Noahic covenant is given in Genesis chapter 9. I don't want to bore you or lose you, but this is critical to see. God gave Noah in that covenant some basic commands. Global population. Noah, I want you to populate and literally subjugate the entire earth. Global population. Global rule. You will now rule over the planet. And civil government understood by capital punishment. If a man takes a life, his life is forfeit. And so God now injects in the third dispensation civil rule, authority, man's authority and government in the earth. What was the judgment? Tower of Babel. Because instead of globally populating, they clumped. Mankind stuck together and said, what could we do if we all hang in here together? We could build a monument to our glory. We could build a pagan temple to the skies. Babel. And so, Genesis 11 tells us God's judgment was the scattering of humanity throughout the entire world to do what they were supposed to do. But here's what it was like in those days. Romans 1.21, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And that, of course, is the problem we have today. Humanity is once again futile in our speculations. Foolish in our sense of intellectualism. We figured it all out. We think we're so smart. We are no different than the babbling fools building the tower. Well, that was the third uh, dispensation. The fourth dispensation is the dispensation of the patriarchs. Okay, so we have innocence, conscience, governance, and now the patriarchs. And this age runs from Abram or Abraham to Moses, beginning with now the covenant God makes with Abraham. Now he's going to focus in, hone in on a singular people. But among those people in the early days, we see adultery, deceit, treachery, and all of that from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. (laughs) Three men and their families. And all of this mess, and we see that throughout the rest of the study of the book of Genesis. And so the judgment following that, Egyptian bondage. They go down into Egypt because of the famine. They go down there. They live for a while, but ultimately they end up in bondage and slavery in Egypt. There was sin. So far in all four of the dispensation mentioned, sin and mess, carnage in the world. Fifth dispensation. It's just getting better. The dispensation of law. The dispensation of law. Beginning with the exodus... The dispensation of law runs from Moses to Christ, where God says, all right, you're still not getting it. We tried innocence in the garden. We tried conscience. We tried civil governance. I came and gave promises to the patriarchs, and you're still not understanding. I'm going to give you my perfect law. And by the way, God did that. You Bible students know Romans 5.21 tells us he did it so sin would increase. He gave the law so that man's failure would become even more heightened and clear. So that we would realize our sin nature. So that we would see it as compared against His beautiful, perfect law. We couldn't do it. And so now we're in this dispensation of law. The judgment of that dispensation is the fall of Jerusalem twice. 586 and 70 AD. You can't keep the law. And so the pinnacle of the law, the temple itself, would be wiped out and taken away. Romans chapter 2, verse 9. Paul writes, There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there's no partiality with God. The dispensation of law is where we see God proving through a people that no one is good enough. Where does that bring us? Number six, the dispensation of grace. And that's where we are today. We are alive in the year of His favor. We've talked about quite a bit recently. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. This is the year of His favor. This is the age of grace. And it's also been called the church age. We've had 2,000 years of the church in the world. 
And there are those who would say, Hallelujah, finally, finally we've got it right. (laughs) How are we doing in the church age? I got to confess to you, I feel bad bringing up the church again. And as I've said before in the past, I love the church. I was raised in the church. I've grown up believing that the church is God's method of getting His message out in this age, in this dispensation. I still believe it is. But as a global church, I believe that we are dramatically coming up short here at the end of the age. The Bible says we would. How are we doing in this current dispensation? Look back at verse 7 of chapter 4 again and listen to the description here. Her consecrated ones, if you want to note this in your margins, it's Nazarites. The Nazarites, those who would take the Nazarite vow, no drinking, no touching dead things, no cutting your hair. Specific vow that Jewish people could take to sanctify themselves and consecrate themselves wholly and solely to the work of the Lord. John the Baptist was probably a Nazarite. Samson, we know, was a Nazarite. So the Nazarites, her consecrated ones, were, note this, purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than corals. Their polishing was like lapis lazuli or like sapphire. I read that and I thought, you know, the Nazarites sound surprisingly similar to the church. At least to the church ideally. Think about it. Consecrated. The church is consecrated to the work of God in this age. Spiritually, by the blood of Christ, we are made purer than snow. Spiritually, whiter you could say than milk. We have the vitality of coral. That red coral. We are alive in the spirit, right? So we've got a vitality that no one can claim but those who are walking in the spirit of God. Clear thinking as sapphire. Why? Because we've got the mind of Christ. Verse 7, I think, beautifully describes the ideal Christian. How the church should look, is supposed to look in this world, filled with the Holy Spirit, consecrated, purer than snow, whiter than milk, vital as red coral, clear as sapphire. What a great description. But I ask this question, has the church at large become like the Nazarites became in verse 8? Their appearance is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It is withered. It has become like wood. Consider it like this. They are covered in soot. Christians stained by the world of which we claim to be free. Unrecognizable in the street. Are we any different than anyone else? When the world looks at a Christian, do they see someone who's unique and different? Who sparkles like a sapphire? Who is purer than snow? Or do they see someone, yeah, I know you go to church, but it doesn't make you any different than me. You do the same stuff I do. We go to the same bars. We go to the same movies. We read the same books. We do the same things. You're no different than me, unrecognizable in the street. Shriveled to our bones. I wonder, are we shrinking back in terms of biblical truth? The biggest heartbreak to me as a 48-year-old Christian is watching my generation of churches shrinking back from truth. Instead of boldly proclaiming truth, pulling back and saying, oh, I know culture right now says this, therefore we need to change what we believe. And I don't see it changing in God's Word. Withered like wood. Are we becoming hardened to the gospel message? Such that Christians won't even go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ anymore because, well, we've already shrunk back and we don't want to look any different than anyone else and we're stained by the world. Paul says, whatever was written, Romans 15, 4, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 17, interesting verse, he says, As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. 
Our hearts reflect who we are. Just as we look into water or look into a mirror and see our reflection, we should be able to recognize the heart of man reflected throughout all of history and see ourselves. We look at every dispensation as we've done, all six. And in every single dispensation, man has fallen woefully short of the glory of God. The sin nature. Even in the church age. Now I'm not saying that Christians aren't saved. We are. By the grace of God alone. There's one more dispensation to come if you want to jot it down. It's the dispensation of the kingdom. It is that millennial kingdom of which Revelation 20 mentions six times. The dispensation of the kingdom. But understand this. Sandwiched between this current age and that age is a tiny little seven year period that closes out this age. And you know what it is. It's the tribulation. And in the tribulation, there will be a global church. We were talking about this, Glenn and I, the other day. Think about that for just a second. In the tribulation, there will be a church. The church has representation in the tribulation. Not the true church. Not the church that has been caught up. The church that has been called home, pulled out the ambassadors before the storm, before the war, called out home to be with Jesus. But there's a representation of the church. What does that mean? It means that we should not be surprised to see today aspects of the Christian church denying Scripture, walking away from their namesake, Christ Himself. Because what's going to happen is the church will be raptured. The church will be caught up. And then, in that vacuum, those who were Christian in name only will continue to be a church. But now it's going to be a church of a different kind. Church of the coexistence. A church of the global mindset. A church of the anything goes. A church of the universal mentality. Which church do you want to be a part of? See, that's, that's my question today, and it's my question for the church of today. Which church do we want to be? The church home with Jesus or the global church of the tribulation? And if we want to be home with Jesus, why, why, why would our appearance be like soot? Why would we be unrecognizable in the street? Shriveling back, hardened like wood. God's judgment is fully justified. God's judgment will be fully justified in that time of tribulation. There will be no one at the end of it saying that wasn't fair. He has been gracious. He continues to be gracious. The fact that we're here tonight is proof positive of the patience and the long-suffering, loving kindness of God. He's still waiting. He's given us today. Should we wake tomorrow morning? He's given us tomorrow. Because of His grace. 1 Peter 4.17 We've read recently It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. I don't want to be hard-nosed and I don't want to be exclusive either toward the rest of the church. I, man, anyone who claims Christ Jesus is my brother, is my sister. Anyone who accepts the truth of His Word. We are part of a much larger movement than I think sometimes we even realize. Praise the Lord. There are believers across the globe who love Jesus and who are getting His Word out and who do look an awful lot like verse 7, consecrated ones. There are also those who look more like verse 8, unrecognizable ones. But Peter does say it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Let's judge ourselves first. Let's be sure. Let's be clear. That we are standing on Scripture and not on culture. Let's be sure that we are standing in love with Jesus and not in love with mankind. Because Peter says, if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? This judgment... Man, why can't we learn this? Why doesn't the world understand this judgment is real? 
And the judgment that, that God proclaimed is coming will come. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I've got to do it somewhere. <laughs> the judgment's coming, gang. You might say, so how do I avoid that judgment? The fifth elegy, the final lament. And gang, this is where we land in a prayer for mercy. A prayer for mercy, and it begins with number one, remembrance. Remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our houses to aliens. We have become orphans without a father. Our mothers are like widows. We have to pay for our drinking water. (laughs) It's not so different than us today. (laughs) Our wood comes to us at a price. Our pursuers are at our necks. We are worn out. There is no rest for us. We have submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. Our fathers sinned and are no more. It is we who have borne their iniquities. Slaves rule over us. There's no one to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin has become as hot as an oven because of the burning heat of famine. Man, I wonder if verse 10 isn't prophetic of what has happened to Israel over the years. I mean, if that's not a Holocaust verse, I'm not sure what is. Verse 11. They ravished the women in Zion, the virgins in the cities of Judah. The princes were hung by their hands. The elders were not respected. Young men worked at the grinding mill and youths stumbled under loads of wood. Elders are gone from the gate. Young men from their music. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned into mourning. And the prayer of mercy begins with the cry of remembrance. It begins with remembering, recognizing the desperate need for mercy. And that's how this prayer begins. Jeremiah is saying, remember, Lord, what's happened. Remember us, Lord. Remember, this is where our own rebellion has got us, Lord. Don't forget me, Lord. Remember me. Does that sound familiar? So that's what the thief said on the cross. Luke 23, 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's the first line of the prayer of mercy. Remember me, Lord. Remembrance. Second, repentance. Verse 16, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our heart is faint. Because of these things, our eyes are dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate, foxes prowl in it. And you may recall that's what the fellow rabbis recognized in AD 70 when they went up with Rabbi Akiva. And they saw that fox dart out. I've told the story now. This will be the third time. And that's the verse that they recognized as prophetic of what happened to them in AD 70, even though Jeremiah is writing it after 586 B.C. Repentance. Notice Jeremiah doesn't say here, Lord, they have sinned. He says in verse 16, Woe to us, for we have sinned. And Jeremiah does what every godly person does. Like Daniel after him. Daniel chapter 9 will repent for his people. We have sinned, says Daniel. Ezra will do the same thing. Nehemiah does the same thing. Godly people humbly own their people's sin. And we need to do that. For as much as I compare, perhaps, aspects of the church today to verse 8 of chapter 4, unrecognizable in the streets, covered in soot, i got to own that, gang. Because I am a part of the church in the world today. And our church has sinned. We need to repent for the way our church has opened the doors to blatant acceptance of that which God calls sin. We need to repent of the way the church has watered down the Word of God. We need to repent from walking back from Jesus. We need to own the sin of the church because it's our sin. I think we could take it a step further and with great compassion own the sin of humanity because we are humanity. 
We're no better than the lost, than the sinner in the world. We have come from that. We should understand that. So Jeremiah, he owns the sin. It's the opposite attitude from the Pharisee. The religious attitude that says, Luke 18, 11, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. God, thank you that I'm not like swindlers, unjust adulterers, or even this tax collector over here. Thank you, I am not IRS. (laughs) The spiritual man is humble. He repents not only of his own sin, but he takes on the sin of his people. And who better a picture of that than Jesus himself? Talk about humility. Jesus who took our sin on himself. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what Jesus did. If we're being made over into his image, it's what we're called to do. Repentance. And by the way, remember that this lament, though it's 22 verses long, suddenly different than all the laments before it, is no longer a stylized acrostic in design. It's the only one of the five lamentations that does not follow the acrostic pattern. Why? It breaks the pattern of rebellion. The prayer of mercy, repentance, breaks rebellion. It stops that old pattern. The pattern that brings on judgment, now we're in the place of mercy. And repentance always breaks that pattern. Number three, recognition. Verse 19 He says, you, O Lord, rule forever. Your throne is from generation to generation. And that's the issue right there. Note what happens. Remembrance, repentance, recognition. As I call on the Lord, cry out to the Lord, remember me. And then repent before the Lord, I recognize what I needed to recognize all along. And that is His authority. His rule. His dominion. I see him as Jeremiah writes here as king and ruler, Lord and Savior, creator and God. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Do you recognize the authority of God in your life? Do you recognize the rightful position and the rule of God over your marriage? This is one of the first things I like to ask couples who come to me and say, we're really struggling in our marriage. Do you recognize that Jesus is the authority over you? Let's start right there. Well, I'm not in love with her anymore. I didn't ask that. Do you recognize the rightful rule of Jesus Christ over you and your wife in your one flesh union? Do you recognize His authority over your business? Do you recognize His authority over your family, over your decisions? You see, the repentant heart, the one praying for mercy, recognizes God's authority. On Thursday nights, when we gather for prayer, and we will again tomorrow night, you're invited to come if you want to just come pray. But we always start the same way. We always start by establishing the presence and the authority of the Lord. Not because He needs it, but because we do. We need to say, oh Lord, help us to see that you are here. Help us to recognize your presence and your authority over us, over our lives, over this fellowship. Recognizing his greatness. When you would recognize his authority, something happens. You begin to see and acknowledge his faithfulness to do what he has promised. Jeremiah says, listen again, you, O Lord, rule forever. Your throne is from generation to generation. And what does that do? Jeremiah is saying, God alone has the power to bring renewal. God alone can bring restoration to the wreckage and the ruin of the Jewish people. God alone can bring restoration to the wreckage and the ruin of your life. If you will but acknowledge His authority. And that brings us to the final aspect of this prayer and of the lamentation Number four, restoration. Verse 20. Why do you reject it? Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. 
In the Hebrew, that final verse reads more as a question than as, than as a statement. It reads more like, have you utterly rejected us? Are you exceedingly angry with us? And Jeremiah finishes the fifth lament, leaving that question hanging right there. But here's the thing. We know the answer. Has God rejected Israel forever? No. no. Is He exceedingly angry? Yeah. But has He rejected His people? No. I believe we could hear the Lord speaking into the silence, No, I have not rejected you. Jeremiah himself wrote in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So we finish Lamentations. We'll spend a little more time in chapter 3 on Sunday. But we finish Lamentations tonight, and I ask you the question, if you are sorrowful, if you are suffering, if you're weighed down, why not pray like chapter 5? Pray this way. Remember me, O Lord. I repent for the sins of myself and my people. I recognize your authority over me and over all the world. Restore me to you, O Lord, that I may be restored. And note that's what he says. Jeremiah writes, Restore us to you, O Lord. And we will be restored. Not restore us to Jerusalem, not restore our kingdom, not restore our grandeur, our glory, our greatness. Restore us, Lord, to you. And then we will be restored. One last thing. Remember this final elegy lacks what I called... When we began, the limping meter. The limping meter, that is the quina in Hebrew. It's that rhyming scheme used in the first four laments, but not used at all here, where the second half of a verse is one beat less than the first half of the verse. So if you're reading it in Hebrew, it would have a, a limping feel to it, and it goes all the way through the first four laments until you get to number five, and suddenly the limping stops. Why? Because mercy stops the limping. Because a prayer for mercy, a prayer of repentance, man, when, when mercy is, re, is asked for, the limping stops. And we as believers in Christ, consecrated ones, we do not limp. We walk in the Spirit. We run and we don't get tired. We mount up with wings like eagles. We don't limp because we have received the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Amen? And Father, I pray... Lord, first of all, again, for those who are sorrowful, whether here among us tonight or those among our fellowship, or Father, again, we extend this prayer out to those in Oklahoma who are suffering and who are sorrowful tonight. We ask, Father, that you would draw the attention of the sorrowful to your divine nature and character. Lord, that we might be remembered by you. Father, I do tonight repent for the sins of myself, the sins of the church, the sins of all our people, Lord. God, I am so sorry that so many in the church have walked away from Your truth. Father, I repent of the times I have. I repent of the times in my own life when it was more convenient to do what I wanted to do rather than to follow what you taught. Father, we acknowledge your rule and your authority and we pray, restore us to you that we might be restored. In Jesus' name, amen.